So a little while ago, I did a video about the generic sort of software that a Linux user would want to use as a university student. And today I'm going to do the same sort of video, but talking about computer science slash software engineering. And I'm going to be doing it in the context of my degree, because obviously I haven't done every single software engineering degree out there. So I can only really talk from my perspective. So if the software that you use isn't covered, it's probably because... I haven't actually used in my degree, but I feel like my degree is at least fairly representative of the sort of degrees that are out there. So if you're new to the channel, you know what to do and let's jump right into it. Now the first category I have on here is languages and this is going to be very much dependent on your university and how up to date they are and a lot of stuff like that. Now I've heard from some people they do Objective C at uni still. I don't know why in the world you would try to teach people Objective C. But this is the list of languages that I've worked with. So Python, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, C++, Swift in the context of iOS development. And during my data and web mining course, I'm probably going to be doing R. So all of these languages either have a interpreter or a compiler on Linux, or with the case of JavaScript, it runs in your web browser. So it doesn't really matter. So all of that stuff will be fine. Now, the one problem you're obviously going to have there is when I mentioned Swift. So it was Swift in the context of iOS development. There is a Swift interpreter on Linux. The problem is you don't have the Apple libraries. So because of that, you're not going to be able to do that part. So in that case, you could run like a Mac OS VM or anything like that. Or if you've got access to a Mac OS system, then I guess you could also use that. Now, as for IDEs, this is where you can usually get some customization in because usually they don't lock you down to using a specific IDE. So during my first Java course, we were told to use Eclipse and that's because we had a practical exam where we were also using Eclipse. But everyone in my degree pretty much realized that Eclipse is absolute garbage and pretty much after that migrated over to the JetBrains suite. So whatever the Java tool, I can't remember what it's called. It's just better than Eclipse. And along with that, we were also using things like Android Studio in my Android development course. And that being based on the JetBrains suite is also available on Linux. Now, when I mentioned R, we're probably gonna to be told to use something like R Studio. That is also available on Linux. And then for my C++ course, we were using Qt Creator, which Obviously, being the program to build Qt applications is going to be available on Linux because Qt applications are fairly popular. I don't know if they're more popular than GTK apps, but they're definitely very popular. Now, the two places I would have had some difficulty if I was running Linux at the time would have been with Visual Studio and Xcode. So Visual Studio we were using for the C Sharp stuff, and we also use that for JavaScript. Not because you should use Visual Studio for JavaScript, but just because we were also doing ASP.NET in that course, so we just all used Visual Studio for that anyway, so there was no reason to switch over to something else. Xcode, you're pretty much stuck with if you want to do iOS development or pretty much any development on macOS, unless you want to do like Flutter or any of those libraries that aren't native libraries. If you're doing native development for an Apple platform, you pretty much are stuck with Xcode. There might be some others you can switch to, but I haven't looked enough into macOS or iOS development to tell you that you could or you couldn't. So if there are alternatives, then I guess you could use them, but I don't think there would be an alternative that you could run outside of the Apple ecosystem, because even if you did have some other IDE you could use, you still need access to the Apple libraries, and I can't imagine that Apple's going to really let you get them off of a macOS system. So VMs are probably your best bet there. I wasn't running... Linux at the time, so I didn't have a problem with it. Obviously for the Xcode one, I did need to run a VM for that one. Actually, no, I was running Linux at the time for the Xcode because that was last semester. The Visual Studio stuff, I wasn't running Linux at the time for though. Now for code editors, we didn't explicitly get told to use any code editors except for one, and it might be the worst code editor on the planet, and that would be Idle. If you know what Idle is, then you'll know how garbage that program is. So Idle is the default code editor that comes with Python. I don't know if it comes on the Linux distribution. I know that it does on the Windows and the Mac OS version though, and it is possibly the worst code editor on the planet. It doesn't have tab completion. It doesn't have number lines. It really doesn't do much. It's honestly about as useful as writing code in something like Nano or writing code in Notepad. There's no reason to ever use it, so everyone pretty much switched over to PyCharm instantly, or just honestly anything else. Most people did PyCharm just because that's what was popular at my uni, and we also got a uh, free JetBrains license, so it was just easy to go to that. 
Now, I also tried out Visual Code and I'm using Vim now. I'm honestly just gonna stick with Vim for most things. If I don't need a compiler, I'm probably just not even gonna bother. I could get a build chain set up working with Vim. It's a bit of a hassle. I'll probably end up doing it at some point. Right now though, I've just got web languages or interpreted languages. In those cases, there's no reason to bother using anything else besides Vim for me. And then Visual Studio Code I was using for any JavaScript development after the initial stuff with Visual Studio. I didn't actually have a second course where we were doing web development. That was more about side stuff just because I wanted to do some side web projects. Now, next up, we also have desktop development. So for this, there were a couple of different libraries we used. So we used JavaFX, which being a Java library, you can do perfectly fine on anything. You could probably do it on like a Raspberry Pi if you really wanted to. Wouldn't recommend it. You probably could though. Then with Qt Creator, we we're obviously using the C++ Qt library. It works perfectly fine on everything that you can run Qt Creator on, so no problems there. Being a library that people write apps for on Linux, there's no reason you can't write them on Linux, so perfectly fine there. The one problem is obviously, as I was mentioning with Visual Studio, you had Windows Forms. Did I mention that? I did mention the ASP.NET stuff before, but we also did some Windows Forms development, so that's also a problem. Now, you can sometimes get it working within Mono. Mono's been getting better and better and better. I know some people who did that course on macOS using Mono Develop or is it Mono Develop on macOS? Whatever it's called on macOS. I think it is. Anyway, they were using Mono on macOS and they didn't have any problems, but depending on the sort of features you're using, it might be a problem. Like if you need to do things such as accessibility, I know that that's a bit of a problem on Mono and there's a couple of things that don't work perfectly. So in the end, you're probably better just using Visual Studio for that, just because you are doing Windows development. So you're probably better off just doing it on Windows. But if you can get it working in Mono, and if you're not using anything too new, you might as well just do that. Now for mobile development, we used libgdx for my Android course. We were doing Android game development. So that's a Java library. I think there might also be Kotlin bindings for libgdx. I haven't checked, but I assume there might be. That would be cool if there are, but even if there's not, it's Java development and you can do that on Linux perfectly fine. It's just Java. Now, obviously you're gonna have problems with the native iOS development I did, but I've gone over that already. Now, next up we have web development. So for this, we did AngularJS. I'm not saying Angular, not the new version of Angular. I mean the really old version of AngularJS that was absolute garbage. I don't know why we were doing AngularJS. My web development course was so outdated, we did AngularJS, jQuery, and an older version of ASP.NET. I'm not really sure why exactly, because we didn't really cover any of the newer web development standards. So we didn't do anything like React or modern Angular or really anything that really makes any sense. It was a lot of really old technologies. Now, I don't know why, like we didn't even do PHP. That's another thing, we didn't do PHP either. So, I, I don't know, my web development course was garbage. This is one of the places where it was probably deserving to be updated. I don't know if they're updating it with the new version of the course. I know they've changed the name of it. Whether they've changed the content is another question though. Now, obviously the ASP.NET stuff will be a problem. If you're using ASP.NET Core though, then you have absolutely no problem on Linux because that's all open sourced and everyone's got that working on Linux already. So that's really cool. If you're using the older stuff though, then you're gonna be in a bit of a problem. But obviously, as always, just run a VM and you'll probably be fine. Now, next up, we have game engines. So the two big ones you're probably gonna come across in Uni are Unity and Unreal. And you're gonna have no problem whatsoever running either on Linux. So that'll be fine. Now, I didn't actually include this on my list, but I should have. I didn't do any of the big game development courses, but I know that you had to do some 3D modeling in those and generally they don't care what you do the modeling is as long as you can get the model files to them. So you could probably be perfectly fine using Blender. Honestly, I would recommend just using Blender if you're on Windows in the first place because Blender is just a really good program. But if you are on Linux, then just use Blender and it'll work fine. Basically, that's all I have to say about Blender. I like Blender. I've done a bit of 3D modeling with it. It works great. It's a really good program. Now for databases, this is one of the places where there is pretty much absolutely no room to budge whatsoever. You have to use what they tell you to use, otherwise there's gonna be some weird incompatibilities. 
Now, I didn't realize this until just now, but apparently SQL Server will run on Linux. I didn't know this, this is really cool. So if I was using Linux at the time, I could have done that. Now you might be in luck and they'll use something like MySQL or MarioDB. Maybe they'll use that. And if that's the case, you'll be perfectly fine to use those. But my degree was with SQL Server. Now I did say that SQL Server is available on Linux, but we also had to use something along with it. So we were using SQL Server Management Studio and this by the looks of it is only available on Windows. So that's a problem, but if you want to avoid using that and just use SQL Server through the command line or something like that, then I guess you could. It'll depend on what your university actually requires you to do. Maybe you have to do some practicals that actually require you to show some stuff in Management Studio. And if that's the case, then you'll have to actually use the uh, Windows install or at least have it running on a Windows system. Now, the next thing we have is UML tools. So if you don't know what UML is, then you're probably still in your first year of university because UML is loved by the object-oriented crowd. Basically, it's a way to model different objects and their connections to each other. It's also used for things like database designing. So for this, we use UMLet or UMLet or UMLET, whatever you want to call it. That's written in Java, so it'll run on a toaster. You'll be fine with that. I use Dia now, which is available on Windows and it's available on Linux. It's just a better piece of software, so I'd really recommend it. The piece of software that I wouldn't recommend that we had to use is DB Designer. This is possibly the worst piece of software ever written. It will crash every five minutes from literally nothing happening. I have no idea how this program is written so badly, but it is available on Linux. So if you do have to use that awful, awful program, then you'll be perfectly fine and won't have to run it in a VM. Because if you have to run it in a VM, it might crash even more. So it's a pain. Just if you can avoid DB Designer, I would really recommend it, but maybe you can't. If you're doing my degree, then you definitely can't, that's for sure. Now we're almost done. We've got a couple of categories left. So next up is AI. So for this, I didn't really do much AI. We were doing Python with Jupyter Notebooks. So That'll be fine, it's just a Python library. You can install it with pip, so you can run on anything that has pip installed, basically. And then that'll actually run inside your actual web browser. So anything that has a web browser and has pip, you can use Jupyter with. Now, obviously, you're probably gonna have to have JavaScript working on your browser, so don't try to run it through like W3M or something. But if you're not one of those people who disable JavaScript on everything, then you'll probably be fine with Jupyter. Next up is networking. So for this, we had to use Wireshark, which is available on Linux, and Cisco Packet Tracer. Now, I don't have anything special to say about networking. Networking is not my forte. I actually have very, very little knowledge in networking. So all I can tell you is both these pieces of software are available on Linux. I think they're both also on Mac OS as well. I was using Cisco Packet Tracer on Mac. So for the last category, we have virtual machines. So for this, I've been told to use things like VirtualBox. If I remember correctly, we were running like Ubuntu VMs or something. And the other piece of software is some of the VMware products. Now, if you're told to just use VirtualBox, you'll be perfectly fine. If you have to use some of the VMware products, then you're gonna have to set up a Windows VM just to run a VM in that VM. So that might be a problem. But normally, you could even use something like QMU. And the reason for that is generally they don't care what VM software you're actually using. The reason they tell you to use a specific one is so they can come up with instructions just for that software. It's similar to how you're told, use this specific model of calculator. It's because they can come up with instructions for just that one, instead of having to come up with instructions for a bunch, and it just makes it easier to teach the course basically. So because it's like that, you can typically just use whatever you want in the end. They generally don't care. If you have a practical that's like actually set up a VM and show me it's set up in this software, that's a really dumb prac, but maybe you'll run into a lecturer who wants to set up something like that. Now we've gone over pretty much all the software and if we look back at the list, pretty much everything is gonna be fine except for basically Visual Studio Xcode, native iOS development, Windows development, obviously. I can understand Windows development being a problem outside of Windows. I can understand that, that's that's not a big deal. And then obviously the ASP.NET stuff. Now, in regards to this one, if you're not using ASP.NET, but you're using ASP.NET Core, then go right ahead and use that on Linux. Go right ahead and do it on like a whatever you want really, because it's, it's open sourced and 
If you want to get it running on whatever you want, then go ahead. And being open source, it's probably already working on pretty much anything you'd want to write code on anyway. And the rest of this, there's not really a problem, except if you have to use Management Studio for SQL Server. So really in the end, oh, and obviously VMware down the bottom here. So in the end, there's only about four things that I would have had to run a VM for. So for a software engineering degree, there's pretty much no reason you couldn't just always be on Linux and then just on the rare occasions where you have to run a VM, run a VM then. Or your other option is to just dual boot, but I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you have a spare hard drive just laying around. If you have to go out of your way to buy a hard drive, it's probably not worth the investment. Yeah, it will be a bit quicker, but a lot of this software, it doesn't really matter if it's a bit slower, unless you have a bit of an older computer. Now, if you're running like an older ThinkPad, you probably do want to actually dual boot because running a VM in that is probably not going to be great. Even if you're using some of the more lightweight VM software, running Windows on top of Linux on an older piece of hardware like that is probably not going to be a great experience. If you can deal with it, that's, that's perfectly fine. Go right ahead and do that. If I remember correctly, now this wasn't with Linux, but back in my first year of university, when I was using Management Studio, I was actually on a macOS system. So I had a bit of an older MacBook Pro. I think it was a 2015 model at the time. If I remember correctly, that, that sounds about right. And I had to run VMware to run Windows so I could run Management Studio. Now the problem with this is macOS by itself isn't very light. And then Windows is even less light. So running that on top of macOS, not the greatest idea. It was really slow and I really didn't like it. Now, this MacBook Pro, it wasn't even one of those MacBook Pros that deserves to be called one. It was, I think, the bottom tier. So it was basically a glorified MacBook. So not the best experience, wouldn't recommend it. If I was to go back to that time, I probably would have just bought a second hard drive to run it. It probably would have been way quicker. So I think that's pretty much everything for this video. So if you like this video, remember to smash that like button and leave me a comment down below, let me know what you think. If you want to see more videos like this, remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below because it'll really help the channel out. I'm now aiming for 10,000 subs and any help be really appreciated. Up on that corner, I've got the playlist this video's in. So go check that out if you want to see other videos like this. Down below, I've got all of my social links, so my Discord, my Telegram, and all of that stuff. So feel free to go check any of those out. I've also got my support links down below, so if you'd like to support the channel, then go check out my Patreon or any of those links down there. Obviously, if you don't want to do it, then you don't have to, but any help will be really appreciated. And lastly, I've got my alternate video platforms, so my library and my BitTube, so feel free to check any of those out. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.